joining Time Out with PSOA, where sports officials share their stories to help recruit, train, educate not only sports officials, but players, coaches, administrators, and fans. Through this information, we're going to help make us all better for the game. Thank you for taking time out with PSOA. Today's episode will be Baseball Rules Talk with Andrew Fulton, current NCAA Division I baseball umpire, supervisor of umpires for the ICCAC Conference in Iowa Juco. <clears throat> Andrew, before we get going, if you could tell the audience, and, and keep in mind this is for fans, players, coaches, as well as sports officials, how did you get your start in sports officiating? Why do you continue sports officiating? And what other endeavors do you have in store um, in that sports officiating world? Well, Sean, thanks again for, for inviting me on the podcast. I, I really think that what we're doing here is, is an important, worthwhile uh, endeavor, trying to educate, recruit, train, and retain all sorts of sports officials across the country. Um, a little bit about my start. When I started, um, it started – Honestly, when I was 12 years old, so 20, 25 years ago, in a in a town called Eagle, Nebraska, uh, my dad was um, on the Alvo Eagle Recreation Board. And he came home one day, and he goes, "Hey, Andrew, uh, we need somebody to umpire this t-ball game. Do you want to make seven dollars?" And when I was 12 years old in 1997. Um, if somebody told me I wanted to make, if you want to make seven dollars, um, that would get me to do a lot of things, and umpiring a t-ball game was one of them. So that was when it started. Um, I went and worked that first t-ball game. Nobody really yelled at me. It's pretty easy. They gave me seven dollars and a hot dog, and I went home. Um, then uh, they pretty much said, "Hey, what about that? What about the coach pitch game tomorrow night? You want to do that one?" And I was like, "Well, how much does that pay?" And they're like, well, that pays eleven dollars, and I was like, sign me up. So I just kept stacking checks all summer long, um, and when I was fourteen years old, I was able to pay cash for my first car. So it was a uh, pretty crazy stuff. But that's that's how I got my start, um, you know. And and then things things start to started to snowball a little bit. Turns out uh, my luck in the officiating side was a, a little bit better than my luck on the playing side. Um, just more. My coach always called me an intellectual player. Let's just let's just say that um, I wasn't exactly the best uh, athlete on the field. So uh, you know, I, I kept at it and kept at it, and you know, things fell into place at the right time. I was at the right time, the right place a few times, and and uh, you know, you work your way up the ladder. And, and currently, I'm a, a Division One baseball umpire. I umpire in the uh, in the Big Twelve, the Big Ten. American Athletic Conference, um, the WAC, the Summit League in the Valley. I've worked uh, 12 Division One conference tournaments. I've worked uh, Division Two national championships in 2014. With I think it was I think it was on my eighth or ninth ninth uh, nine Division Two regionals at that point in time. So I've uh, I've been around the block in football. I, I worked uh, 10 years of college football, at the small college level, and currently. Work high school football um, in in uh, the Dallas Te- the Dallas Texas area. So then I have worked high school and college basketball um, all the way up to the Division One women's level. Um, and so uh, that's that's kind of where I where I've started and where I've uh, where I've come. Um, it's the journey is a fun one. And if anyone wants to talk more in depth about uh, you know some of the struggles along the way, we can definitely talk about those too. But uh, that's that's where I started and where I came from, and um, and like you alluded, like you uh, mentioned earlier, is I I am the supervisor of officials for the ICCAC um, for, the, for baseball, and uh, I've been doing that now for for eleven years. So um, I've been involved in that, and that's a that's a whole other endeavor um, with its own uh, you know set of skills and and pitfalls and challenges and and the rewards. So that's, uh, that's another endeavor that I, that I go on and, and it's, it's been a, it's been a great ride so far. Well, we appreciate you taking time out with PSOA today to 
share your stories, share your educational background. Um, and we had Tim Cordell on a few episodes ago in the PSOA podcast, and he was talking about streamlining information. Um, so coaches, umpires, fans, players, administrators are hearing the same words. Um, and, and that is w- one of our goals here when we're talking about baseball rules. And the three main rules uh, that we came up with for this episode is strike, box, and catch. Um, so we're going to start with strike. Um, most people, when you think strike, we're, we're just looking at umpire's judgment. Um, as we go through things, what we want to challenge the listeners here, whether you're a coach, umpire, uh, or a fan, is there's very little judgment as a baseball umpire when it comes to strike. So we're going to start with the first one, um, a swing and a miss. Andrew, different level of, uh, of baseball has different rules. Can you go over one? What is the rule of that swing and miss check swing from the high school, college, and professional level and what you do as an umpire to determine, yes, that batter swung at the pitched ball? Well, this is this is one of the rules that is one of this is actually I think one of the most inconsistent parts of the rules between the three levels. Um, the rule changes dramatically uh, from the high school level uh, to the to college level, and then even more so to the professional level. And I think I'm going to start with the most ambiguous one, and that is official baseball rules. So a lot of like like you said across the country, a lot of youth, youth leagues uh, use official baseball rules with their own modifications, including little league. Um, and a number of the other organizations, U-Triple-F-S-A, uses uh, official baseball rules with their modifications. And the definition of a swing in official baseball rules is simply attempting to strike at the pitch. And that leaves a lot up to interpretation. Um, you'll hear a lot of people uh, mention things like, well, does he break his wrists? Does the well, bat travel through the, the, the swing zone or the, stri- or the striking zone or the hitting zone? You hear a lot of, of crazy things that, that go on there. And honestly, at the end of the day, the only guidance that that rule book and that rule set gives us is, did he attempt to strike at the pitch? And if he did, it's a strike. Um, it, it's so subjective that I think that that is one of the biggest holes in the professional rule book um, at that point in time. So I, it's, it's really tough. Now, it gets a little less ambiguous when you go into the high school and the, and the college rule. So in the high school rule, if the bat barrel uh, crosses the front edge of home plate, it's to be deemed a strike. Um, and uh, in college, it's called the half swing. And uh, the half swing, if the, if the bat barrel uh, passes the front hip of the hitter, it's to be uh, deemed a strike. Now, there's a few things that make this really difficult, especially in a two-umpire system, uh, which is honestly what most of baseball is. Um, people watch baseball on TV. The majority of baseball um, played in, in the world is played under the two-umpire system. Um, so if there's nobody on base and we have a right-handed hitter, so we have two conditions there, nobody on base and a right-handed hitter, um, then we have help down the first baseline with our, with our base umpire who's on the first baseline. But if those two conditions aren't met, we don't have a lot of help as the plate guy. So we have to, we have to call this ourselves a lot of the time in the two umpire system. Um, what makes that sh- difficult, Sean, is that we have to judge a pitch first. You know, we have a pitch come in and it's, if it's obviously a ball, that makes our job a little bit easier. Or if it's obvious a strike, that makes our job way easier. But it's those borderline pitches um, that make make our make our job a little harder. So as you know, we if we use what we call prop. Have you heard of prop use of eyes before, Sean? Is that something you've heard of? A few times here and there. Yep. So we track the baseball all the way from the the pitcher's hand as it comes into 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 home plate and crosses the plate and goes into the catcher's wall. Well, we have to do all of that in order to determine if it's a ball or a strike. Uh, for our, for our, we have to do that in order for our brain to get enough information 
to, de- to make a decision on whether it's a ball or a strike. If we don't do all that, our brain doesn't have enough information. We're still forced to make a decision, but we don't have the information that we need to make that decision. So we judge that, that pitch, track it with our eyes, properties of eyes, track it all the way into the mitt to get all the information that we need. And then at that point in time, if it's a close pitch, then we have to go to the bat and, uh, and judge whether the, the, play, the, the hitter attempted to hit the pitch, whether it satisfied whatever rule set um, we're working with that day, um, whether it's a strike or not. Yeah, so, and I'm going to sort of rephrase it, free, rephrase what we discuss here. Coaches out there, you got to understand there's a lot of information this umpire's processing. Is it a ball? Is it a strike pitch? Then on top of that, we also have to now transition our eyes to the batter's actions. Very difficult. Um, so if an umpire potentially, in your judgment as a coach, misses that check swing, hopefully this information gives you a little understanding of potential reasons why it was missed. Umpires, very important lesson to learn here. Whatever level of baseball you are working, make sure you know what that rule is. Coach, in my judgment, the barrel broke the front hip of the batter. It's going to be hard to argue a judgment. You're showing the coach that you know the rule. Um, Show that credibility that you know the rule and communicate what your judgment is nice and clearly. That's going to help umpires and coaches, again, share the information, understand each other's position, and move forward to the next pitch. Yeah, it's a... it's a lot of information to process quickly, and it's one of the most commonly uh, missed calls because, as the plate umpire and the two umpire system, we just don't have we don't have the time and the, and the mental resources to get all that information. We, our eyes can't move that fast, and if we do move our eyes too fast um, to have a great look at a swing, sometimes we miss the pitch. And which ones we have to go through a progression: pitch, then swing and then whatever else we have to umpire at that point in time. All right, so we got the the call that's most missed out of the way, check swing, half swing in college baseball. Now let's Mm -hmm. go into just batter doesn't swing. We are only processing one thing, and that's ball entering um, in in the strike zone or not in the strike zone. So if you want to talk about, first, what is the rule for the strike zone? What is the room for error of an umpire strike zone. Um, and then I know NCAA is coming out this year with a standardized national strike zone. And at the very end, we'll talk about the limitations technology has um, when it comes to that standardized strike zone. Yeah, this is uh, – let's start at the beginning. Number one, what is the strike zone, right? And the rule book defines it as um, everything – from the left edge of the plate to the right edge of the plate, right? From both sides of the plate, the plate's 17 inches wide. Um, and the box, it's, it's an imaginary box that goes from the hollow uh, beneath the hitter's knee all the way to the midpoint between uh, the shoulders and the, the top of the belt. So the strike zone is actually fairly large. It's bigger than a lot of people realize it is, especially up and down. Um, what does it mean for a pitch to be a strike? The strike zone is a three-dimensional object. So um, it's not necessarily the front edge of home plate. It's not necessarily the back tip of home plate. Um, it's everything in between. So it is a pentagon, a pentagonal column. How about that, Sean, for some math words today? It's a pata- pentagonal column. Um, if any part, and we're talking any part, down to a lace of a pitch baseball touches any part of that pentagonal column, it's to be deemed a strike. Um, we're going to see with the, with the advent of some technology coming in in the next few years um, how big that strike zone actually is. Uh, when it comes to balls and strikes, the biggest issue that as umpires we have is we go too far off the plate. Um, that's 
and we have and we have difficult time at the bottom and at the top of the zone. Um, that is backed up by a lot of the data that we have right now. Um, that is where umpires have the biggest issues. But the biggest thing is, is if the baseball, if any part of the ball touches any part of the strike zone, um, it's to be deemed a strike. And I think that's honestly one of the biggest questions a lot of people have. They'll see the baseball that's sitting literally right next to home plate with just a lace touching home plate. And they're like, that ball is a baseball off the plate. Well, actually, that ball's a strike. A baseball off the plate would be a baseball between that baseball and home plate. So a baseball off the plate is actually just a little over two and three quarters inches off a home plate. Does that make sense, Sean? It makes perfect sense. And now that you you touched on that ball off the plate, um, has NCAA or Major League Baseball given umpires any room of error? So if a lace isn't touching home plate, what is that? mirror or margin of error allowed for umpires as long as they consistently call it a strike is it a ball off the plate so what what uh what major league baseball has done up until now um and their technology is is pretty good um what they've done is they have said this is in the umpire um their contract right now actually this is what they're they're graded on and and evaluated on um they are allowed a two inch margin of error on the edge of home plate. Um, now what that, what does that, what does that mean in practice? Uh, tech, uh, what, what that means is that if the technology says that the ball was on home plate, a piece of the baseball cut home plate and you called it a ball, that is a, a missed pitch. If the ball is more than two inches off home plate and you call it a strike, that's a missed pitch. If that ball is in that buffer zone, that margin of error, two inch margin of error, um, that's kind of a, a you get it. The umpire, it's an umpire freebie. Um, yes or no. Um, it, if you call it a ball, it doesn't, it doesn't count against you. If you call it a strike, it doesn't count against you. Um, and there's really, it doesn't, uh, factor in consistency at that level. It, all it does is say if it's in that, if it's in that zone, we're going to give that one to the umpire and let him make his judgments. Uh, him or her make his or her judgments at that point in time. So that mirrors a little bit of the technology limitations that we have right now. Um, there's a, there's a number of systems out there that are able to track balls and strikes, trajectory of pitches. Um, one of them is, uh, what we call, uh, uh, quest tech. That's the old system. Um, pitch at, Pitch FX, I think, is the new one that uh, that Major League Baseball is using um, in college baseball. We see a lot of them uh, using a, a system that we call uh, Sean. What's that system called? My goodness, TrackMan. TrackMan. Yeah, there we go. Uh, a lot of them are using TrackMan. Um, TrackMan is a, is a is a fairly low cost option that a lot of schools are using, um, but there are limitations with all of these systems and. The limitation of the technology is, is that it has about a two-inch margin of error. So the technology may say that the baseball is on the plate when it's actually two inches off the plate. Technology is also only as good as those that are utilizing it. So um, track name requires to have requires somebody to be in the press box manually entering in the information um, as to whether it's a ball or a strike. Um, called ball, called strike, swing strike, ball put in play, foul ball, all those things um, require a human on the other end to, to input that information. So those are some of the limitations of it. Um, you see college baseball right now, the NCAA and Paul Gilgay with the SEC is attempting to put into practice a, uh, a nationalized, standardized strike zone evaluation program. And what that's meant to do is, okay, let, let's just go back. I watch a game on TV, a major league baseball game on TV. Um, we see the box on the screen. We see that a pitch is out of that box on the screen. We go to the post game report and we see that that box on the screen is, is really wrong a lot. 
especially on the marginal pitches on the edge. Um, that box utilizes video technology, which video technology is actually the least accurate of any of our technologies. Uh, TrackMan utilizes what's called son it uses sonar technology. Um, and now we're starting to see, or in radar technology, and then we're starting to see now some laser technology that's actually proving to be a lot more accurate. Um, so when you're watching those games on TV and it says that pitch is down or it's up or it's in or it's out, that video technology is really, really inaccurate. And you go to the post game analysis or so the post game uh, strike zone report, you'll see that the umpires get those pitches right more often than not. Um, it's the same thing in college baseball. Um, you'll start to see those, the technology is, is not that good when it comes to balls and strikes, especially if they're putting the, the box on the screen. Um, and when you look at the, the post game track name reports, um, you'll see that those pitches typically are, are not where the TV says they are. So as, as a coach or as a, a spectator watching these games, we just have to make sure we remind ourselves. Um, that those techno the technology is not infallible. Um, we're going to see that this year as as AAA um, is utilizing the automatic the ABS system, automatic ball strike system, and they're using TrackMan for that system right now. And one of the things that's interesting about TrackMan is that TrackMan actually is simply a projection of where um, the baseball went. It, it's not actually tracking um, the baseball crossing home plate. It's simply a, traject, a projection of where the baseball went based on spin rate, velocity, angle, um, and distance. So it, it takes its reading, um, I think, almost 30 feet from home plate, and it projects on where the baseball is going to be when it crosses home plate. So that's what, And that's why there's a two-inch bunch of air on that technology. Um, but when we talked about what Paul Gillier is trying to do with the NCAA and having a standard, standardized strike zone interpretation, well, all that means is that we need to make sure we're evaluating, we're not evaluating umpires solely based on these dots on a, on a graph, that we need to have some, there needs to be some nuance with it and some understanding that the technology is fallible because people are treating this technology like it's, like it's literally infallible and it's, and it's the word of God and it simply is not. Yeah. So I'm going to put the, a lot of stuff in, in layman's terms here. Don't always believe everything you see and hear on, on, on television. Um, that box is there uh, for entertainment. It is there um, for the fans. Um, it's not always there to support the umpires on that game. Um, so take that box, take that dot for what it is. Um, I will say this, another thing that, that I've heard through talks is technology, no matter what realm we're in, it gives people direction, but it's never absolute. Um, so as an umpire, I, I know I've gotten a, a dot track on, on a plate job that I've done in the past, and I've seen holes in my judgment. I've seen holes in my strike zone. Now, did I miss every single pitch in that area? No. But there were there's certain... a ton of value in that, Sean. There's oh. a ton of value in in using it as a loading tool, mm -hmm. and and especially if you as an umpire are actually honest with yourself and are able to like look at that stuff and be honest and be like, man, I really thought that pitch was a strike, and the track man saying that pitch is five inches off the plate. <laughs> you know, maybe we need to evaluate that, right? Like it, and. <laughs> and as you move up and as you start to advance and as you start to improve your game and realize when you're right and when you're wrong, man, Sean, it, it, it does help. It's a great thing, but it's not infallible, like you said. Yep. And, and as we get closer to the baseball season on our YouTube channel, we're actually going to go over plate stance. And what I found on my holes in my strike zone was it was simply how I was lining up my feet. I would line up my feet different with the right-handed batter versus the left-handed batter. And when I squared my feet uh, properly, that, that hole in the strike zone changed. So, again, it's that technology that allowed me to see 
the pitches I was missing, and I found the reason why I was missing those pitches. Um, before, so, so, can ahead. we talk about philosophy a little bit, Sean? It, that's actually like, where we're going next. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Great minds think alike. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about the plate being 17 inches. <clears throat> we talked about the size of the baseball, two and three quarter inches. So we're up to, let's see, 19, 21, 22 and a half inches wide with two inches of error on either side of home plate. So now we're up to 26 inches of potential strike. All right, so going into the philosophy, I will tell you, I will talk about youth umpires first. And the reason why we teach these two philosophies at the youth level, number one is pace of play. Number two is player safety. We, we would like pitchers to throw less pitches, and one way to do that is to call more strikes so that batter swings at pitches more often as well. And then the other thing is entertainment. You, you don't want to sit at a baseball game for two hours and seeing 20 batters walked. We, we want to see that ball put in play. We want to see the defense field it and throw it. Um, so what we teach our youth umpires, every pitch is a strike until proven a ball. Number one, our mindset, every pitch is a strike until proven a ball. The other one is if that pitch is hittable, we need to call it a strike. Um, and, and, again, that's the youth level starting. Um, and now, Andrew, go back into the philosophies now as you advance as an umpire. And from a coach's perspective, how does the philosophy change as the level of baseball increases? Well, I can tell you that over the last, you know, 15 years of my career at the Division One level, the philosophy at that level has changed dramatically. Um, and that is due to technology and the advent of technology. And uh, they're, really, they're really expecting us to be excellent at the Division One level now. And that, I think that's great. I think that, that is, if that's what their expectations are and that's what the game wants, the players are better, uh, the coaching is better, the pitching is better, the hitting is better, uh, you know, the, the umpires need to be better too. So what they're, what the, what they're saying with, this, with the... With the implementation of this national strike zone uh, initiative they are really bringing the, the, the strike zone in um, and we want to make sure the baseball is hitting the plate at the division one level my goal at the end of the day is that I don't want to ball a single pitch that is on the plate that is my goal and the way I do that mentally is I say, man, I think that pitch hit the plate. In my, if in my head I say, I think that pitch hit the plate, I call it a strike. Because if I think it hit the plate, it, it might have. And if I call it a strike, then I'm, never gonna, then I'm not going to fail at my number one goal, which is to not ball a pitch that's on the plate. And if I call a pitch a strike on one that I think might have caught the plate, I'm, I'm probably going to be within my one inch to two inch margin of error. That's the biggest thing. If you think it caught the plate, if you think that thing might have caught the plate, man, that might have caught the plate, strike it. And that's at the division one level. Um, we want to make sure we're not balling pitches on the plate. Uh, pitches at the bottom of the zone, um, we need to you know, make sure we're tracking the baseball in, have good timing. And I, I don't want to miss a pitch at the bottom of the zone. Um, we get fooled sometimes, get some that are a little bit low, and that's something that we're really trying to fix, uh, you know, as a whole group of college umpires we're trying to fix and make sure we bring the bottom of the zone to where it's supposed to be. Um, and then not, not balling pitches that are strikes at the bottom of the zone, too. We don't want to be too technical down there. Um, we don't want to punish catchers, right? We, we need to make sure we're not punishing catchers. We need to make sure we're getting everything at the bottom of the zone that's a legitimate strike and calling it a strike. Um, if you look at the major league data, they ball too many pitches that are at the bottom of the zone. Um, that's what the technology bears out. And, you know, if you talk to some minor league umpires who are giving feedback and getting, you know, pitch reports and things like that, they say, yeah, we, we need to make sure we get all the pitches at the bottom of the zone, um, call them all strikes, um, that are, that are legitimate strikes at the bottom of the zone. The top of the zone, same thing. Um, we ball too many pitches at the top of the zone. Um, that are strikes 
And the way we do, the way we fix that is just literally with, with focus, concentration, tracking. So we have, you know, each pitch in, a, in the Division One college baseball game is is requires an immense amount of focus, concentration. Um, so that's at the Division One level, right? We want to make sure we don't blow any pitches that are on the plate. Um, we want to make sure that we we don't go too far off the outside corner. Sliders on the outside corner, man, they got to be on the plate. They got to be on the plate because there's too many times we think that pitch breaks too much in that last foot. And and let's just be real, the pitch isn't breaking six inches in that last foot, and we need to make sure we're tracking the baseball all the way in. Um, so that's that's at the division one level. As we start to move levels and adjust levels, uh, the division two level. When I go to umpire division two game, if I'm working the plate, I use the exact same philosophy that I use in the division one. Those players have abilities, uh, hitters have abilities, and they deserve the exact same effort in strike zone that I have in a division one game. Um, in, a, in an NAI or junior college game, if I'm working the, ba- uh, the plate for one of those games, guess what, Sean? I use the same exact approach. Mm-hmm. The same exact approach. Um, now, what changes? What's the biggest thing that changes between those levels? What do you think, Sean? What's, what do you think is the biggest thing that changes? Speed of the game, speed of the pitch, quality of framing the pitch. Right there. Quality. So when we talk about framing, um, this is something that drives me absolutely wild right now. Um, we have coaches teaching, a, a lot of coaches and catching gurus teaching players to pull pitches and you know do all sorts of crazy stuff with the baseball once they catch it. Let me tell you right now, when you start to move the baseball after you catch it, it makes it a lot harder for me to do my job. So when we talk about framing a pitch, all I want you to do as a catcher is just catch the ball where it's at. Give me an opportunity to process all that information. If I have to start making decisions on where the pitch was after you started to move it, you're adding another element into my game, into my decision making process that makes it harder for me. And at that point in time, I'm going to err on the side of I don't think that was a strike. And that's I'm not saying I'm balling every pitch we pull, right? Because some of them are legitimate strikes. I need to make sure I don't miss pitches that are on the plate. But if you're making me make decisions and you're going to start pulling pitches on me on borderline pitches, man, that makes my job a lot harder. And that's a conversation I'll have with catchers too. Like, hey man, just catch what's at. I'm going to, trust me, we're going to be okay if you just give me an opportunity to see the baseball where it is. So I think catching is honestly the biggest difference from level to level. And the abilities of the catchers, like I said, we don't want to punish catchers uh, with, with differing abilities. So as I move into the NAI level, or a junior college level where we don't have a division one prospect of catching, um, you know, I'm going to take that into account. If I think the pitch hit the plate, I'm going to call, if I think the pitch might've hit the plate, I'm going to call it a strike. If I think that it was at the bottom of the zone, I'm going to call it a strike. I'm going to take the catching ability um, and try and take that out of my game, uh, my decision-making process. Now, like we talked about, though, deliberately pulling pitches and making my job harder, I'm going to try to be a game manager at that point in time and say, hey, man, just give me a chance to see that pitch a little bit longer. If we start moving, it makes my job a lot harder. And uh, sometimes I I make mistakes. And if I'm going to make mistakes, it's pretty hard for me to err on your side at that point. Um, I'm not saying that I'm balling pitches that are in the strike zone. What I'm saying is, is that I have to have a philosophy and a set of decision-making protocols. At the end of the day, I have to decide between two things, ball or strike. And, you know, I have a hierarchy of things that I have to go through. And, and if I have to make that decision but with less information because of actions of the catcher, I, I really, I, it makes it hard for me to err on their side. Yeah, so moving, we're going to transition here into the next rule into catch, but... To close up strikes, coaches, to allow the best accuracy, the best consistency in the strike zone, 
have your catchers do the same thing every single time. And then you're going to avoid that comment of, Andrew, call it both ways. And Andrew responding, I did. I called it a ball in the top of the first inning. All right. Exactly. So yeah. the, the more consistent the catchers are receiving it, the more consistent the umpires are going to be processing what the players did. Um, this last s- segment, we talked about tracking a lot. All right. Tracking the baseball, tracking the baseball. The next rule that we're going to have a discussion over is catch. And we're actually doing the same exact process of tracking the ball when it is in the enclosement of the mitt. Um, So first, let's talk about what is the rule. If you were going to simplify the rule, what is a catch? Well, so we use the word catch colloquially, right? Um, We catch a baseball. Somebody throws it to me, I catch it. Somebody hits it to me, I catch it. Somebody pitches it to me, I catch it. And the definition of catch changes based on the action that preceded it. So, Sean, I want to talk about first, what does it mean to catch a batted ball? Right? So catching a batted ball means that I, before it hits the ground, um, an umpire, a runner, or anything else, um, I, I get firm and secure possession and have voluntary release. So that is the simplified version of what a catch is. Firm and secure possession and voluntary release. Um, and that is for a batted baseball. What, why do you think that changes when it comes to throwing baseballs, Sean? Any idea? No. No? Enlighten the audience. Yeah, so um, when we have a thrown baseball, the, the act of catching a thrown baseball doesn't actually really mean anything. It's what we do when we have firm and secure possession of the ball. So if we throw and catch a baseball, people are like, well, he's out at first base because he caught the ball before the guy touched the base. Well, that's not true. He's out of first base because he tagged the base with possession of the ball before the runner touched the base. That's why. So we don't necessarily have firm and secure possession and a voluntary release when it comes to a caught ball. We have firm and secure possession in the act of attack. And that is one of the biggest misconceptions when people use that word voluntary release. Uh, When they shouldn't necessarily use it, it can be an indicator. It can be a, a way we, we go through and make those decisions and make those judgments, but that's not part of the rule for that. So a batted ball. In order for me to, to catch a batted ball and, and record an out, I have to have firm and, secure, firm and secure possession and voluntary release. So firm and secure possession in either my hands or my glove. So if it hits my glove, pops out, and I catch it in my hands, has the ball hit the ground? Sean, has the ball hit the ground? No, sir. So I have firm and secure possession. I grab it in my hand prior to the ball touching the ground. We've got a catch. Um, if the ball, if I miss it, it bounces off my face. I fall down. It lands on my chest. And then I pick it up with my hand. Is that a catch? The answer is yes. Firm and secure possession um, because it's never hit the ground. As long as I pick it up with my hand or with my glove and then take it out of my gloves um, with voluntary release, uh, we have firm secure possession. If I just trap it with my elbow against my body, or I trap it with my glove against my body, or it's in my underarm pit, um, those don't count. Because uh, you may have firm secure possession, right? You may have it. I may have it firmly and securely trapped underneath my arm in my armpit. Um, but it has to be, in order to satisfy the, the rule, it has to be in the glove of the hand. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's a catch of a thrown ball. Uh, or, I mean, of a batted ball. Again, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into catch because we get this a lot from coaches on the field, you know, where we are processing 
that play that you're just talking about. A, a batted ball hit into the left center gap, and a fielder dives, and the ball is loose, and we don't know what happens to the ball. But all of a sudden, we see the ball goes off the chest. Then we see the hand reach for the ball, and now the, that ball is raised in the air, and we're like, all right, did that ball ever hit the ground? No, that ball never hit the ground. And we come up good two seconds later, that's a catch, that's a catch, that's a catch. And then all of a sudden that runner on third base is still standing at third base because they weren't going to run home until they knew if we called it a catch or not. You know, And it's timing, <laughs> timing, timing. And coaches, if you take anything from that exact situation, a legal tag-up starts when that batted ball touches the glove of the fielder. It's not after the catch is complete with the voluntary release. So once that ball is touched, boom, that runner could legally tag and go to the next base. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point, Sean. So, yeah, when it comes to, like you said, legally tagging, um, the runners are allowed to advance as soon as the ball is touched, not when the catch is completed, because the catch is a process. And this is something that we, we, we sometimes forget. So if I'm running out to the outfield, I'm sprinting towards the wall, we got a deep fly ball, the ball goes in my glove, I have firm and secure possession. I smack up against the wall. I fall down and the ball falls out. This is something we see, honestly, fairly often. Where I dive in, the ball's in my glove. I dive, I hit the ground, I roll over. And as I'm rolling over, the ball falls out because I just got the wind knocked out of me. Um, these happen all the time. So the first touch occur, can occur sometimes, you know, seconds before the catch is completed. We have to regain control of our body um, after making a catch, regain control of our body and have voluntary release in order for us to have um, a, a catch on the baseball field. But on that first touch, we're allowed to, we're allowed to advance. So it can really feel like, and this is a feeling, this is not a, this is, that's all we're going off of when we're, when we're, when we're playing, coaching or watching, it's all just feeling because we're not watching it like the umpires watch it. Um, we feel like that guy didn't tag up. This man, he was five steps off the base when I looked at him. And there's no way he tagged up. And if you go back and look at the video, um, he definitely tagged up. If you go back and look at the video, honestly, in general, um, at the major league level, at the collegiate level, there's not as much video as the youth in the high school level. But, you know, runners tag up legally a vast, vast majority of the time. Um, so, you know, outs on appeals are just, they're, they're pretty rare and they're rare for a reason. Very good. So closing out here on the topic of catch umpires, make sure you have good timing. It is absolutely nothing. There is no call until you make it a call. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. There's no reason to be in a rush or hurry on, on this catch, no catch, um, decision. The other thing is get that angle to see the ball enter the glove and or hand. A lot of times, umpires, you want to run to a catch. You don't want to run to the catch. You want to run to the angle to see through the catch. Um, angle over distance. So, Sean, you, you mentioned that a little bit about, about you know, when, when we're going out. So if we're a base umpire, um, in the two umpire system, and we're in the first base, and we leave a trouble ball, which is you know one of four things: fielder charging in, fielder going back towards the wall, um, a fair foul decision, or conversion potential conversion fielders. If we leave a trouble ball and we go out on that baseball, um, there's a lot of different reasons that we would go out, and depending on where the the critical action item is on that. So if it's a guy diving in, this is most of the time a guy diving in, um, where we want to make sure we have that look on the trap catch situation uh, we need to build the angle when we go out and get set um, to give us a better chance of getting those plays right um, the more umpires we have in the field the more opportunities we have to do this so in the three umpire system you know it gets a little bit better we even have more opportunities to build angles in the four umpire system we have many many more opportunities um, to build better angles on plays like that and in the six umpire system we have uh, just so many opportunities to build those angles but the biggest thing is, is that, you know, and, and the more advanced and the more, the more you become, the more you start to think about that on us at the scientific level. And it becomes a lot more fun 
to start to figure out how to umpire those plays in the outfield. Um, but like you said, angle over distance, getting set, if at all possible, plays in the outfield. If you're in the middle of the field, though, like in the two-umpire system, you got runners on base, middle of the field, man, we don't have a lot of options. So we get the, we build whatever angle we can um, while still staying in the working area, um, you know, or if we need to come to the grass dirt line because it's something threatening the fence or it's a real trouble ball, potential conversion fielders, we do that. Uh, but the best way for us to get those plays right when we have tough angles or not optimal angles and not optimal situations is just to take our time. And you said the word timing. And honestly, Sean, this is one of my, this is like one of my pet, pet peeves. Um, people, people say the word timing and we don't explain what it means. And so what we, what we end up doing is we just do the same thing we were doing earlier, but we just get slower. <laughs> and so what we're saying is give yourself enough time to, to gather all the information, give your brain enough time to gather all the information that you need for your eyes, that for your eyes to get that information and for you to make it an informed decision with all the information you can possibly have. And if you do, you do that, that's what timing actually is. So I prefer to say proper use of eyes. Go through your whole checklist on all of these plays, um, especially catches. You know, is it in the glove? Yes. Um, if, I, if I've already made up my decision when I see it in the glove and I don't see him get up off the floor or off the ground, or I don't see the hands go to the glove because we've got a runner tagging and going home, we don't utilize all of our information. Um, we don't we don't give our, put ourselves in the best position to get all of those plays correct. All right. Well, that takes up all of our time here today with Time Out with PSOA. It was a great talking session over baseball rules of strike and catch. And I hope all the coaches out there learn a couple bits of information to educate their players and so they could give the umpires a better opportunity to get the call right. We also hope we shared some rules knowledge, some philosophy knowledge, so when we communicate with players, with coaches, we now both have a better understanding of what is a strike and why it is a strike by rule. Um, what is um, a catch? Why did the umpire move a certain way? Why did they freeze? Why did they take time to have that proper use of eyes to get to that uh, final resolution of that is a catch? Um, Andrew, I, I appreciate you taking time out with PSOA today. Um, there's a lot of things that we talked about today that really got my mind thinking and spinning of myths of baseball and some of these situations of strike, catch, and all of a sudden the umpire gets the call right, but they're getting yelled at because so many people think there's myths of baseball. Do you have any interest in coming back in a future episode and talking about plays that you've been yelled at because people who are watching that game think they know the rules of baseball versus these are the real rules of baseball? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, we just have one episode to do that in because I think we could fill that with, with about four weeks of, uh, of content. Sean, I'd love to come back and talk about it, though. All right. Challenge accepted. All the listeners out there, thank you for taking time out with PSOA today. Make sure you follow us on the YouTube channel, on Facebook, on Twitter. We're going to be actively adding some video to coincide with these podcasts. So coming up in the next few weeks will be what is a strike? How do we call a strike? What is a catch? And how does proper eye movement, how does a proper angle over distance, and what does timing look like? Um, thank you again, and until next time, remember, you're only as good as your last call. A Heard at Sports Network production.